Today's cool fact of the day is that the next time you're swimming in, in a swimming pool and you have to go pee, you shouldn't. A new study just found that when uric acid, which is present in your urine, especially if you eat a lot of fructose, uh, and chlorine, which is there in the swimming pool, when they come together, you get trichloramine and cyanogen chloride. That combination, when you breathe it, is linked to lung, heart, and nervous system disorders. And the USA Swimmers Organization says one in five people admit to peeing in pools and that it's a common practice for competitive swimmers. On that note, let's switch gears. And it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest, uh, William J. Walsh, a PhD who runs Walsh Research Institute. He's got a new book, a really interesting one, called Nutrient Power, Heal Your Biochemistry and Heal Your Brain. And Dr. Walsh here is, uh, is pretty darn experienced. He's an internationally recognized experience in nutritional medicine, and he's looked a lot at nutrient-based psychiatry and nutritional medicine. Uh, the reason that I wanted Dr. Walsh on the show today was because the connection between food and your brain is so terribly important and it's oftentimes missing from some of our paleo discussions or just general nutrition out there. It doesn't really look at the food brain connection and the Bulletproof Diet's all about willpower and focus and making the brain work really well, which results in the body working better. Let's see other big highlights about Dr. Walsh's background, PhD in chemical engineering. And uh, he's looked at chemical analysis of more than 25 serial killers and mass murderers, which is phenomenal. When some, someone's so broken, what happened in their brain is such a great way of looking at, at hacking people to perform better. He's also done nutrition for Olympic athletes, NBA players, MLB players, heavyweight boxing champs. So basically, if, there, if anyone out there deserves the title of a biohacker, <laughs> it's definitely Dr. Walsh. Uh, Dr. Walsh, welcome to the show. Thank you for being on today. Well, hi, David. It's my pleasure. Now, you were trained in nuclear science and engineering, and now you're looking at brain chemistry and human behavior. What's the connection? Well, actually, no, I've, for the last 30 years, I've been engineering the chemistry of people rather than of things. But I, back uh, about 35 years ago, I was a prison volunteer in, uh, in, in the Chicago area. In fact, I founded a group, helped trying to do um, what we could to help ex-convicts make it in society. And uh, even won the, uh, there was, they, they gave me an award as vol Prison Volunteer of the Year for Metropolitan Chicago. So we were really active. But along that way, we learned that if we really wanted to help somebody, it was to, to do it at the time when they were getting out of prison. So I started an ex-offender program and got to know the families of people that had produced a violent criminal. And I, I knew several people who were on death row. Most of the people there at Stateville Penitentiary, uh, where I was doing most of this, were had murdered. So these are a pretty tough bunch of people. And uh, and I and that's when my education began. And I began to ask the question, why are people violent? What's the cause of a severe behavior disorder? And the family, the families were telling me, most of them were saying they knew there was something wrong with this child when before he was two years old. They, they were oppositional, they were defiant, they had tantrums, they were harming animals, setting fires, and they were horrifying their families. And we had always thought and been told that people are violent because of their life experiences and because of their upbringing. So that's what started it. And since I was working at a, at a national laboratory, 4,500 4, researchers, uh, we, my group and I, we started spending a lot of time in the library studying everything we could about psychiatry, uh, mental health, depression, schizophrenia, and which, that's how we started. Which national laboratory was that? Argonne National Laboratory. Argonne. Uh, majors, yeah. So my, uh, my grandparents met on the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos National Labs, and my family, my father and mother worked at Sandia National Laboratories. So the national labs are these crazy collections of people working on really big problems that take long periods of time that they usually aren't allowed to talk about. It's interesting you're connected to one of the other big labs out there. Okay. Well, I, I spent my honeymoon at Los Alamos as a, <laughs> as a visiting scientist, and I was doing plutonium experiments that worked out really well. You might have known uh, Larry Asprey then. He's the guy who figured out how to isolate americium, actually. <laughs> and americium experiments, yeah. Back uh, in a long, long, long time ago. What a what a small world. That's that's phenomenal. And I've been and, to Saint Pia several times too. Well, I, I am I, I so admire 
that you made the career transition because it's a non-obvious one, but also that you were spending time with, uh, with people in prison because when I look at what's going on nutritionally in prisons and also like psychologically and from a, a neurofeedback perspective, it, it just breaks my heart because I don't fundamentally believe that most people are evil, uh, but their brains are just not working. And if your your human part of your brain isn't working very well, your self-regulation has gone. And then you end up doing these horrible things. And it, frankly, a lot of what's going on there is automated rules. It's not even you really doing it. Uh, yeah. So to, to hear that... So long ago, you started looking at these people and examining them. Um, I'm I'm awed to to know that you've done the work, and I want to know more about what you discovered. So, what did you find in the brains of these people? Well, first, first of all, I want to say that I agree with you completely. I don't believe people are evil, and I've got to know several people who had who were on death row, and uh, I think basically they've done some horrible things, but they're not intrinsically evil. What what we did is uh, when we were studying uh, in the library, we, especially at a biology and medicine library that they had that had all this up to date science, what we learned uh, and delving into into the recent science and psychiatry, we learned that there was a revolution going on in mental health around the world, and it was a transition from sort of the Freudian approach where they believed that kids were born with a blank slate and that their whole personality and their behavior uh, was caused really by how they were treated and how they were nurtured. And right around 1965 and 1970 and 75, that's when the revolution occurred. And they did a lot of classic experiments where they learned that the number one uh, factor associated with bad behavior or with schizophrenia or with depression was not uh, was not environmental factors, but was whether they had a family history of the same thing. And, and there were a number of classic um, um, identical twin studies and fraternal twin studies. And, and then the whole world of psychiatry suddenly realized it had to do with chemical imbalances and neurotransmitters and the molecular biology of the brain. And so we began to ask, could it be that the people we were working with, the violent criminals, might have had something like that wrong with them? And so we started doing experiments. I had all these ex-convicts and people in prison willing to give me samples. And we did a scouting, basically a scouting expedition, trying to see if they were different biochemically. And I had, I had people who were volunteering uh, to work weekends and evenings, and uh, it was wonderful. Um, and, we, and we didn't have the government telling us how to do the experiments. We could do these classic double-blind controlled studies with no one telling us what to do and no schedules. Yeah, for, for about a year, we had a lot of data, and, and we didn't get anything that really made sense. It was like, like shooting a shotgun at the wall, and, and we had no data that correlated until the day I met the great Carl Pfeiffer, who was probably the world's premier nutritional scientist back in the, in the, in the 1970s and 80s. And I, I got a chance to meet with him for an hour and he uh, at Argonne National Laboratory, and he um, said he thought we were doing important work. He encouraged us to continue. And, and then he told me that the very first data he got that was really, led, that was really important and, and useful and correlated was trace metals, metals like copper, zinc. Um, there's about 25 or 30 trace metals. And so he encouraged me to look at the metals. And we did, of course, and that's when everything began. We found that, that these violent criminals and ex-convicts had very strange levels of trace metals. And then we began to study, well, why are metals important? And we realized that there are some, a few metals that have a dramatic impact on brain function. <laughs> For example, copper is a, is a key in the, in, in the transition of dopamine to norepinephrine. All of your norepinephrine comes from dopamine, and you have to have the right amount of copper or else that, those neurotransmitters will be at very odd levels. It, and, it's it's really funny because on the top ten list of bulletproof recommended nutrients, you'll find copper, and I actually didn't know the conversion there that you were talking about. So um, that was validating and lucky. <laughs> so well, copper is essential for everyone, yeah. and but the uh, what's really important is that the body has is this wonderful capability of balancing and normalizing copper homeostatically. Well, um, so it's important to get enough copper in your system. However. Uh, you need to have the ability to get rid of excess copper. Yeah. Some people don't have that. And a lot of the violent people that we had, uh, that we, that we studied had extremely high levels of copper. It was, and so the people with episodic violence, the people who would, would have, uh, meltdowns and do terrible things, they were the high copper people, but the sociopaths, the antisocial personality disorders, the, the serial killer types, 
they were low in copper. So copper was a significant early beginning. And then we learned about pyrrole disorders and we learned about methylation disorders. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these people had problems with hypoglycemia and others had clear problems with um, malabsorption. And so we, we began to delve into that and um, the rest is history. Uh, that all started about 35 years ago. And um, after I started getting data and doing double blind studies, he once invited me to his, um, his annual symposium. He had an annual international symposium. And it was kind of a daunting thing because the he had me speaking forth in the morning. The first speaker was Roger Williams, who started all of this. The guy, okay. he yeah, he was the he was the one who discovered folic acid, and he started the whole like, concept of biochemical individuality. And Abram Hoffer was the second speaker. <laughs> Carl Pfeiffer was the third speaker, and I was the last speaker before lunch. I thought everybody's going to go home, or, or go to lunch, and uh, but no, they all stayed. And uh, anyway, from that time on, Carl Pfeiffer and I, uh, he, he, we, we started a collaboration. And he said, bring me some of these criminals. I'd like to run them through my lab and do the complete biochemical testing. So I started, um, I formed a, a public charity, uh, not-for-profit, got some funding. And uh, I, the first trip, I took five ex-convicts, uh, all of them with what we thought was a sociopathic kind of chemistry. And they had done some terrible things. And the, and the six of us went out to Princeton and had a rather interesting couple of days. Um, wow. We, we stayed uh, we stayed in uh, adjoining rooms of the Holiday Inn in Princeton, uh, three in one side and three in the other. And I, I shared a bed with a, um, a guy who, when he took his shirt off, had, had bullet, hole, bullet marks right down his chest. Wow. Uh, and one of the guys was a, was a um, we, we had a, uh, a guy who had, was a, was was a was a guy who killed people for hire, and wow. uh, so it was it was a pretty interesting group. Uh, it was a pretty interesting day, by the way. And uh, at at around eleven o'clock, I got a, I got them all. I, I told them it's time to go to bed, and they wanted to start a poker game. I think, <laughs> really, I think what they really wanted was to take all their money. And I I thought I'd exercise leadership, so I told them, uh, uh, no, I, I we have to get up early in the morning and to get to the, the, the Pfeiffer's clinic. And so I'm, I'm going to go to bed. I don't know about you guys. I'm going to go to bed. So they said, okay, Dr. Walsh, you, we'll, we'll go next door in the other room and you can just go to bed. So I went to bed and about three o'clock in the morning, I heard this noise. I heard shouting and yelling and stomping in the feet around three o'clock in the morning. And I, and I woke up and I went over to look next door, the room next door. And uh, they were watching a movie called White Heat starring James Cagney. <laughs> and what was happening is every time a policeman got shot, they were cheering. I was oh, no. Just appalled. So I went, I went in. I went in. And I said, "It's three o'clock in the morning. We have to get up. We have to get up at seven a.m. to get to the, to get to the clinic." And and they said, "Oh, no problem. No problem. We'll be fine." So the next morning, I had I, I woke up and and I had to wake all these guys up. And I thought, well, this could be kind of exciting, but it was fine. They, and I found out they're like that every night. Sociopaths sleep very little. Um, anyway, we got them to the clinic. They went through all the testing, and Pfeiffer spent the whole day with these five criminals. And when it was over, he called me in and he, and he said, Bill, he said, this is exciting. He says, they're all the same. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, they all have severe pyrrole disorder. They're all zinc deficient. They're all dramatically zinc deficient. He said, they, they're all under methylated. Yeah. Under methylated. They have high blood histamine. And he, he rattled off five or six factors of chemistry. He said, they're all the same. He said, this is really quite exciting. And I, th I was excited because I thought this is this sounds like a pretty neat correlation biochemically that deserves a lot of investigation. So I got up to leave and he said, wait, you can't leave. He says, you need these. And he handed me five pieces of paper. And he said, these are their treatment programs. He says, every one of these imbalances can be corrected without drugs, with nutrient therapy. And he says, they ought to do this. Uh, he gave me a prescri pr prescription of nutrients. And he said, they ought to do this. They'll feel better. Those are his exact words. Yeah. So that, that was how we started with treatment. And then over the next 12 years, I collaborated with Pfeiffer and uh, we eventually did 500 people, uh, starting with violent ex-offenders, but, but then starting to work with kids, violent children who had the same yeah. chemistries. And what we learned was that our outcome studies showed the kids got better, but the adult criminals uh, would get better for a while and then they would stop compliance. And so we had we never succeeded in, in turning our violent criminals into pussycats, but it worked beautifully for kids. So after by 1985, we started focusing totally on children. 
because we were getting what seemed to be enduring benefits with these very violent kids. And, and uh, about uh, 1987, every time I saw Pfeiffer, he would say, Bill, what, what you need, what's needed is a, is a outpatient clinic in the Midwest working with behavior kids. And after a while, I realized he meant me. <laughs> so we, we founded uh, a clinic which we called the Pfeiffer Treatment Center. I named it after the great man because he died just before we opened the clinic. He was going to actually help us uh, design treatments for the first uh, six months of patients, but he died just before we opened. So we called it the Pfeiffer Treatment Center, and um, along the way, we, as we started with ADD and with behavior disorders, focusing mostly on children. And then as time went on, uh, we, we got into other areas. One of the children that came in happened to be autistic. Well, um, it, I, I wondered, well, how did he get into our clinic? We, we, we are not an autism clinic. Well, it turns out we did his chemistry. We found severe imbalances, yeah. but got him corrected, and the kid got dramatically better, according to the family. Well, since that time, we, we eventually saw 6,500 kids diagnosed with autism spectrum disorders. I think, I, I think I've seen more autistics than anybody in the world, and I know I've got the world's biggest chemistry database. I've always kept all the data, and we have the world's biggest chemistry database for behavior. We have more than two and a half million lab results for behavior, and, and behavior disorders come in different types. And, and autism, same thing. Uh, they, uh, they're all under-methylated, but they have a variety of the, uh, of problems that are, are treatable, especially if you get them young. Then we got into depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and, and then most recently, uh, Alzheimer's. And um, we, well, our work is very scientific, and I have all this huge amount of data. And uh, last month was kind of exciting for our, our group. Uh, I got invited to the annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association. That's very prestigious, yeah. 17,000 psychiatrists from all over the world. Um, by the way, it's kind of an unusual group, as you can imagine, all <laughs> these psychiatrists on billing. Uh, but they're pretty dedicated, wonderful people, really. And uh, I was, I was, the, the talk I gave is on depression, because according to my database, uh, the world of psychiatry has a, has a misconception about depression. They believe the, throughout the world, psychiatrists believe that if a person has clinical depression, their problem is that it's a single disorder, basically, and it involves low activity of serotonin and serotonin receptors. My data shows that there are, with all my wealth of data, including symptoms and traits and all this medical history stuff, what we learned is that there are at least five completely different conditions called depression, and only two of them involve serotonin. Wow. And, and so uh, I presented this at APA, and uh, I had a large crowd, and there were four of us on an elevated stage, and uh, when, when we had all given our talks, I was the third out of the four, the moderator said, well, uh, the speakers have all agreed to stick around a while, and if anybody has additional questions, uh, you, you're invited to come up and talk to the speakers. Well, about 15 or 20 psychiatrists rushed up, and they all came to me, which is kind of embarrassing. There wasn't a single one that wanted to ask the other speakers, who I thought were pretty terrific. Um, and um, I, I had mentioned that we have a physician training program. I've got a team of experts that travels around the world tra uh, tra training doctors in advanced nutrient therapy for these conditions, behavior, ADHD, autism, schizophrenia, depression, anxiety. And um, uh, a number of them just said, I've got to learn how to do this. And but what I had showed them is I showed them how, how nutrients have power, which is the name of my book, Nutrient Power. And I selected that name because I think the biggest barrier to this has been that pe most, most psychiatrists and most people in society don't realize how powerful nutrients can be yeah. if you find out what's gone wrong. And, and the beauty of it for us, the, a, a really lucky thing, is that out of the 300 or more nutrients that are really important in the body, there's only a handful that are strikingly important in the brain. And so we don't need to test all 300 nutrients. There's really only about six or seven that dominate mental function. And, and the testing for the, a, a really nice battery of lab tests of blood and urine, it only costs about three or $400. But what are the nutrients, the six most important ones? Uh, what we find are, uh, let's say, methylation disorders. Uh, people who are under-methylated, 
or overmethylated. Um, undermethylated depressives, uh, that's about 38% of all the people <clears throat> in our huge database. We had, we, this was all based on 2,800 depressives with all their lab results and everything. Uh, they're undermethylated. They have, and their problem is actually low serotonin activity and low serotonin levels. And they're the people who actually do quite well on SSRI antidepressants. Um, and and they're, they tend to be people with a strong will. They're self-motivated. Uh, many of them become great athletes or CEOs or, 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 or people like you, David. And, and they, have, they have high, tend to have high accomplishment. However, about one out of four of them, one out of four of the depressive and of, of the, of the undermethylated people tend to run into trouble. It's usually depression, anxiety, OCD, and that sort of thing. Uh, that, so that's, that pretty much describes me. I'm not really depressed, but yeah, I've had all of those things before I got my biology in order. Yeah. I'm the same. I'm the same. Uh, Pfeiffer found that in me. That first group of criminals, he made me go through all of his testing. <laughs> and he told me I was undermethylated. And, and my wife was, uh, he, he got to meet my wife and he told her, make sure he takes these vitamins. And I do. And for me, what it did is it took away migraine headaches that I used to have and no longer have. And it took away my seasonal allergies. I used to have ragweed every August. That was horrible. And it's been gone for 30 years. The, the people, the depressives who are undermethylated, most of them are undermethylated because of, of MTHFR or other SNIPES. I'm sorry, SNPs, yep. uh, which, are, which are really genetic mutations, uh, abnormalities that weaken, uh, um, weaken these chemicals in functioning, you know, like the enzymes, like the MTHFR enzyme. Uh, however, if a person has depression and is undermethylated, you cannot give them methylfolate because of epigenetics. Because mm -hmm. if you do that, yes, you will improve their methylation, but the patient will get worse. And the reason is that, that and we haven't come to the, we haven't talked about epigenetics yet, but there are a number of, a small number of nutrients that have a tremendous effect on epigenetics and therefore on brain function. And folates are among them. And methyl and folate have opposite effects epigenetically. SAMI or methionine are serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Folates are serotonin reuptake promoters. So they make these people worse. Because uh, it's all is really uh, ser low serotonin depression has a lot to do with reuptake. And now, because of epigenetic science, we have the ability to do the same thing that drugs do without side effects and with more scientific precision. We can aim it at the right people. Then there are people who are overmethylated. They do terrible on, on uh, SSRIs. They're, they're the people who, who, and we've had hundreds and hundreds of them, and, and so many of them said they've tried Prozac, and Paxil, and Zoloft, and Serazone, and go down the list, and they say every time their anxiety got worse, their depression got worse. And um, so uh, I think I, I, when I was at the APA, I mentioned in describing this group, I mentioned that, that uh, a simple blood test can, simple, can identify who would be intolerant to these. And I mentioned that this may be one of the major causes of school shootings. Interesting. Because, because if uh, we've done a study, as have others, there's been about 50 school shootings since 1990. In about 25 years, there have been 50 major school shootings where young people, students, have gone and shot other kids or teachers. More than 40 of them involve kids who were okay until they were about 14 or 15 years old. That's completely different from the violent people we studied. And I yeah. studied 10,000 violent children and adults. And most of those kids were in trouble by the time they were three or four years old. The school shooters are different. They're, they were okay. Most of them were pretty good students until they got to be about 14 or 15 or 16 and developed anxiety and depression, got put on an SSRI, and then disaster happened soon afterwards. And uh, I think that um, and, and I'm not the only one. There's a lot of people who know nutritional yeah. science who are beginning to believe that, that, uh, that school shootings, um, many of them or most of them might, might have to do with with exactly that, with with a, a side effect, a very nasty side effect of SSRIs and these antidepressants. If you if you anyone gets one from a pharmacy, it has a little insert, and they warn about the fact that this can cause that one of the side effects is suicidal ideation in teenage boys and young men, and 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 the, the I think that 
to stop school shootings, what I proposed to them, I said, I said, what I think the psych new psychiatrists should do is uh, we're not going to solve the problem by getting rid of the guns because there's 300 million guns in society. We're not going to, that won't happen, certainly won't happen soon, if ever. And then trying to identify mentally ill people who, who have, uh, who should not have guns, that would take forever. Yeah. But uh, but the way that they could stop it fast is to do blood tests before they and before they give an SSRI. What, what's the blood test that you that you're referring to? Well, um, it's a combination of, of, of a blood test and um, um, medical history information. You need because there's a syndrome associated with this under methylation. And uh, a key blood test, um, we can't use 23andMe or genetic testing because that is not a that is not a reliable way to determine methyl status. And the reason is that uh, the SNPs, the MTHFR and those SNPs yeah. that tend to weaken methylation, uh, there are also SNPs that can enhance methylation. So you get about three under-methylated people for every one over-methylated people and you can't tell from the genetic studies because you need to look at all the SNPs. It actually, it's a tug of war between the SNPs that tend, the MTHFR and others that are tending to lower methylation and those that are tending to raise methylation. That is the best explanation of that I've ever heard uh, in, in terms of, of why it matters. I've defaulted to 23andMe when there's a set of you know, behaviors are set of inflammatory markers usually that aren't explained yes. by diet. Someone's yeah. being compliant with a diet. Like, okay, well, it's something else. And you look at the SNPs and you can predict it. But you're actually looking for blood tests that show actual status versus what the genes would predict. And that's really important. Yeah. Even if, you know, you're, you're listening to this driving in your car, you're going, well, this is kind of getting a little bit geeky. But the point is the right nutrients can be the difference between you feeling cranky and anxious and angry and pissed off and being mean to your kids and all that or just feeling like yourself all the time. It, it's if, if you're anyone with anywhere on that spectrum and you don't like how your brain works all the time, this isn't expensive testing. How much is the blood test? You said three, 400 bucks? Uh, for the whole battery of tests, and yeah. this particular test, I think we get for 60 bucks. Uh, and no, okay. uh, it, but it's also, you need to, it'd be nice if you can, if you can verify it with symptoms and, and if yeah. they have a uh, strong will, um, a, a, a obsessive compulsive tendencies, 75% of them have seasonal allergies, inhalant allergies. They usually do not have food or chemical sensitivities. We, we know the symptoms because we've studied thousands of undermethylated people. And you, we can predict the lab results, actually, if you do a careful medical history. So, uh, but the, the, lab, the labs themselves uh, are inexpensive. And I think psychiatry, psychiatrists ought to do that, especially with young men. At Columbine, the two young men who, who shot the kids at Columbine, one of them had recently gone on Zoloft, I believe the other on uh, Paxil, and and they got dramatically worse, according to the parents, and then uh, became homicidal and suicidal. And, and, and that's happened over and over and over, dozens of times. And right now, uh, they're, they're now preventing that knowledge from coming out. Uh, the last several school shootings, uh, for example, the one in Connecticut, which was horrible, uh, the young man who had shot the, the teachers and all those kids, um, they, it's, it's now been publicly released that he was on a psychiatric medication, and they refused to identify it. And I'll bet, wow. it, I'll bet it, I think it's an SSRI, just, just like all the other cases. So I think there's a quick answer to school shootings. And, and the, I think uh, at least I got a chance to, to tell this to a lot of psychiatrists, and, and my talk was – was uh, taped, and uh, a lot of a lot of the psychiatrists take you know sign up, and so they can watch all the talks and not just a couple of them. So that that uh, now there are as I said there are five types of depression. Mm -hmm. uh, we find that there are three major types of schizophrenia, each requiring different forms of of treatment, completely different treatment approaches, different different neurotransmitter abnormalities. And I, I think we've, we've uh, there's a lot we don't know, but it's really epigenetics that has really pushed this forward so we can have truly effective therapies for most of these people. Right. And the reason is until now, we, we've known a lot about diet, how to get good nutrients and quality nutrients into people. We've learned how to adjust chemicals that are in the body and made in the body. But what's been missing are the, the enzymes the genetically expressed enzymes that might be uh, that might be performing wrong because these genes might that 
the genes must, might be misbehaving and giving you too much or too little of a particular enzyme. Now with nutrient therapy, we, and natural therapy, we can fix this. And I think we're on the verge of a new era in psychiatry. Uh, we had the, the Freudian era that lasted until 1965. Then there was the biochemical revolution in psychiatry from 1965 until the present. And I think we're right on the edge of a new era where we'll be able to, to fix all these psychiatric problems without foreign molecules. We'll be able to normalize the brain and we can do it naturally without drugs. And that's the, that's the era that's beginning, it's just beginning. But I think in 50 years we're gonna be there and my, my group is trying to do everything we can to speed that up. Are you hopeful that, that this is gonna to take root? Because right now, if you say taking this methyl donor, which is just a natural amino acid, let's say, it, yes. if you say that that cures depression in this one of, you've made a drug claim for something and the drug companies will then either take your license or prevent you from selling the nutrient, or they will then classify something that's in every piece of meat you eat as a drug and then restrict it and charge a lot of money for it. Like, how are we gonna get around that problem? Well, uh, we have learned a way to get around it. And, and what we do is we have to be very careful to say, we don't treat depression. We don't treat anxiety. We don't treat violent behavior. We treat chemical imbalances. We, we study people and if we find zinc deficiency, we fix it, we normalize it. If we find a methylation disorder, we fix it. Sure. If somebody has pyroles with a B6 and zinc extraordinary deficiencies, we normalize them. And, and so we don't claim, but what we do show is outcome studies. We show the outcomes of, of, of what is reported. We don't claim that any one person ever got better, but we have studies that we've published in peer reviewed journals that show that when you study hundreds of people, like once I think we did 700 violent children and adults and, 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 and um, published what happened to their, their violent behavior episodes. And 91% of the families said that they were less. And more than, uh, I think it was 57% or 58% said it, their, their violence had completely disappeared. We don't claim anything and uh, we don't say it works because that, that would get us in trouble. But what we, what we can show is what happens to the patient, what the patients and what their doctors report. And we do, might do something like Hamilton D scales or Beck scales that are that are, 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 are respected by psychiatry for depression, for example. We've done hundreds of these and actually the numbers get better after we fix these other problems. And and we're what, what we do is not uh, really opposed, we're not opposed to drugs. Actually, psychiatric medications have helped millions of people. Sure. It was, it was the best they had in 1965 and for the last 50 years. But now we're learning how to do things better without side effects, normalizing the brain instead of putting powerful foreign molecules into the brain. And that's the way that, that I'm sure societies and science will go. And as science advances, the need for psychiatric drugs will fade away. That is a remarkable vision. Uh, based not just on uh, any one domain uh, where you've spent your, your career and your life, but for people who want to perform better at whatever it is they're here to do, what are the three most important pieces of advice you have for them? So this isn't just about Nutrient Power, your book, or anything like that, but just your entire wisdom of your life. Well, I think a person needs to have quality nutrition. In a way, in many ways, we are what we eat. So I think you need to do that. However, people are biochemically unique and, and individuals, and the the best diet for one person is not the best diet for someone else. So it, I think, yeah. it, but I think diet is very important. I think physical fitness is really important. You need to keep your body active, and then third, I think you really need to keep your brain active. And those are the three. If you had to list the top three, those would be the three that I would go for. Thank you so much for both the work you've done uh, to expose some pretty amazing things about nutrition uh, and also just some of the nonprofit thing you've done, things you've done around uh, people in prison, around autistic kids. <laughs> it's, it's an impressive body of work. And, uh, actually, if I, if I could, yeah. uh, my, organi my organization now is still a uh, not, not for profit. We're a 501c3 public charity, and our, our, we're still doing research. We're still doing active research. I've got a really exciting autism research study. We're about to do it, trying to prove decisively that autism is epigenetic. But our main activity is training doctors. We have a team now that travels around the world, places like Australia and Ireland and mm -hmm. Norway 
and, not, and recently in the USA. Uh, in October, we're going to have our, our next training program for doctors who want to learn how to do these kinds of therapies. It'll be in Oak Brook, Illinois in October, if anybody is, if any doctors are interested in that sort of thing. So I will definitely post links in the show notes on bulletproof.com. But in the meantime, tell everyone who are, people who are driving in their cars, people who have mobile phones, what's the URL for your book and what's the URL for your training program? How can they get a hold of you? Well, they can get the book. Uh, of course, they can get it from Amazon, but they can also get it directly from our from our website, which is www.walshinstitute.org. Org, Walshinstitute.org, and that has uh, all the information, and, and, and a person can uh, can can uh, purchase the book directly from our website if they would like. I think it costs 15 bucks or something. We made it as cheap as we could. Try and we, we're not interested in making money, but we, are, we do want to get the word out. And the name of the book is Nutrient Power. And that was carefully selected because that's the message. We want people to realize you don't necessarily need a drug to help a person with depression or anxiety or even autism. Uh, that nutrients have the power to do this if you know precisely what a person's uh, deviation is in their in the nutrients they have, what their chemical imbalances are. If you if you can understand who a person is uh, that has these problems, you can usually help them with nutrients. So, thank you, William. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Have an awesome evening. If you've been listening to this podcast and you're wondering where to start, why don't you just jump in with both feet? Check out the Bulletproof Total Upgrade Kit, which is available on UpgradedSelf.com. Save a ton of money and feel what it's like to be bulletproof. But sometimes I'd drink coffee and I'd feel really good and then I'd crash. And then I'd feel good and I'd crash. Until eventually, for five long, dark years, I quit drinking coffee. Until I realized it wasn't the coffee. It was the toxins that formed during the production of mass market coffee. I re-engineered the coffee process to create the Bulletproof process that makes beans without the toxins that rob performance from you every single time you drink most coffee.